Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Abraham Lincoln, and the focus is the most important election. And we hear that phrase all the time, but put those aside. The most important election in American history was 1860 literally the future of the country hung in the balance. Abraham Lincoln was coming off his defeat in 1858 in the Senate race against Stephen Douglas in Illinois, so he had gone back to his law practice, but his friends and supporters were really pushing his candidacy for the presidency on the Republican ticket in 1860. Now, Lincoln was not ready to accept this in terms of being a candidate, but he was starting to accept a lot of speaking opportunities as he was out there talking about the topic of slavery and the strong position of the Republicans, that there should be no more expansion on this topic. He spoke in Ohio and Indiana, Wisconsin and Iowa and Kansas, pushing for the rights of blacks on a moral tone, always as part of his message. In one case, he said in Kansas, we want and must have a national policy as to slavery, which deals with it as being a wrong, right and wrong. Ever since those Lincoln-Douglas debates, this became a big part of the theme in Abraham Lincoln's addresses. Well, some of the smaller newspapers in the area started pushing Lincoln's candidacy, and then he got a big boost. The Chicago Press and Tribune in February of 1860 came out for Lincoln. This was the first large paper to do so. But Lincoln was still kind of an unknown on the East Coast, which is why he gladly accepted an opportunity and an invite from Henry Ward Beecher to come to speak at his church, the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, New York. Now, Lincoln worked really hard on this speech. He knew there was going to be a large audience, a new audience for him, and a lot of East Coast journalists were going to be there, so he wanted to make an impression. At the last minute, the speech was switched from Beecher's church to the Cooper Institute, which is also called Cooper Union. February 27th of 1860. There were three themes in this important speech for Lincoln, and the first was focused on the Founding Fathers, in which he disagreed with the recent Supreme Court decision in this Dred Scott case. According to Lincoln, I defy any man to show that any one of the Founding Fathers ever in his whole life declared that in his understanding any proper division of local from federal authority or any part of the Constitution forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories, which is what the Supreme Court had just said in Dred Scott v. Sanford. According to Lincoln, the Supreme Court simply got it wrong. His second main point at Cooper Union, he had nothing to, the South had nothing to fear from the Republicans because the Republicans were accepting slavery where it already stood. They just didn't want any more expansion of slavery. Lincoln said, as those fathers marked slavery, so let it again be marked as an evil not to be extended but to be tolerated and protected only because, and so far as its actual presence among us, makes that toleration and protection a necessity. It's willing to tolerate and protect slavery where it existed, but no expansion. And this is where Lincoln made his third point about to his Republican allies. Where do they go from here? According to the Lincoln, their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong, talking about slavery, is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy. Wrong as we think slavery is, we can yet afford to let it alone where it is because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation. But can we, while our votes will prevent it, allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in the free states? In our sense of duty, if our sense of duty forbids this, then let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively. Lincoln's bottom line, consistent step after step, slavery is wrong and we must have a line in the stand, no more expansion of slavery beyond where it already exists. Well, headlines spread throughout the nation after Lincoln's speech at Cooper Union. He got a lot of uh, attention to this. Tens of thousands read about the speech. He was finally starting to emerge as a national political figure. Well, after the speech in New York, he took a little trip to New Hampshire, where he went to visit his son Robert, who was uh, studying at the time at Phillips Exeter Academy. And while Lincoln was up there, he got more opportunities to speak in the New England area. And he took several of these. And in fact, He even indicated to Senator Lyman Trumbull, a friend, that he was really now starting to to be interested in this run for the presidency. He told Trumbull, I will be entirely frank. The taste is in my mouth a little. Ever so subtle and simple for Abraham Lincoln. Well, Democratic Convention was the first of the national conventions to try to pick a candidate for president in 1860. And this was a disaster for the Democrats. 
Democrats have held solid as a national party for the last three decades. But here in 1860, they fractured along sectional lines, again, on this topic of slavery. They met in Charleston, South Carolina, and tried for 10 days to pick a candidate and decide on a platform. And they simply failed at it. Eventually, 50 Southern delegates simply walked out of the event. There were no results coming out of Charleston. The best they could do was agree to try to meet again in a couple of months in June in Baltimore to try again. Well, this left a wide opening for the Republicans who were meeting in Chicago in the middle of May of 1860. There was a building that they called the Wigwam. Now, this was a little bit of a hometown advantage for Lincoln. It's in his home state, but he was not the favorite going in. Senator William Seward from New York, the former governor of New York, was actually the front runner. As he had been a leading Republican from the very beginning days, even before there was a Republican party on many of these topics. In fact, during the Compromise of 1850 debates in the Senate, Seward made a name for himself when he declared that there was a higher law than the Constitution when it came to topics like slave, slavery. That made him very popular in this Republican Party. Now, so you've got Seward in the mix, Lincoln's in the mix, a few others were in the mix as well, prominent Republicans, none of whom actually went to Chicago for the event because that simply wasn't done. Candidates didn't go. They had other people represent them at these conventions. And so for Lincoln, Judge David Davis was the leading representative, but he had other friends, Leonard Sweat, Stephen Wogan, Henry Whitney, Ward Lehman were among some of the people who were trying to orchestrate things on the behalf of Abraham Lincoln. His strategy was to be everyone's number two. If, if Seward didn't win on the first ballot, he wanted to be the next one in line. As Lincoln wrote to Samuel Galloway of Ohio, my name is new in the field, and I suppose I'm not the first choice of a very great many. Our policy then is to give no offense to others, leave them in a mood to come to us if they shall be compelled to give up their first love, whether that was Seward or someone else. Well, this worked to perfection. On the first ballot, it was Seward in the lead, 173 votes, Lincoln had 102, and then a smattering of others were falling, uh, falling behind. Quickly moved to the second ballot, where it basically became a two-person race, and it was just about dead even. Seward at 184, Lincoln at 181. Well, Lincoln went over the top on the next ballot. It only took three ballots to pick a winner. As Seward was stuck at 180, Lincoln vaulted all the way up to 231 and a half. So he was one and a half votes short, actually, of the majority needed for the nomination. We we're just about ready to go to a fourth ballot when David Carter, the chair of the Ohio delegation, caught the attention of the chair of the convention and announced a change. Four votes in Ohio were being switched to Lincoln. That put him over the top. The bells rang, the cannons roared, and Abraham Lincoln was the Republican nominee for president of the United States. Lincoln was back home in Springfield monitoring all of this via the telegraph, and the news arrived, his crowd around him very excited. Lincoln never personally got all that excited himself, and he told his supporters very calmly, well, there's a little woman who will be interested in this news, and I will go home and tell her. And that's what he did. A couple of more actions at the Republican convention. They had to pick a vice president. Hannibal Hamlin from Missouri, uh, from Maine, rather, was the, the nod for the VP. And then they had to focus on a platform. This was important to Lincoln. He wanted to make sure that he was aligned with the Republican platform, and certainly he was. The platform included primarily no more expansion of slavery, the immediate admission of Kansas as a free state, free homesteads to territorial settlers, the support for federally funded internal improvements, which Lincoln had always supported, including in this case, a railroad to the Pacific Ocean, and lastly, the maintenance of the existing naturalization laws, all part of the Republican platform. Now, Lincoln reviewed this. It was totally in alignment with his beliefs. He was happy to send a letter, handwritten letter, to accept the nomination as the Republican candidate for president. Next month, the Democrats tried again. They did meet in Baltimore, no luck still split on those sectional lines. And again, the Southern delegates walked out. They formed their own convention in Baltimore. You had two conventions coming out with two candidates. For the Northern wing of the party, the popular sovereignty wing, they nominated Stephen Douglas of Illinois. The Southern wing wanted full expansion of slavery, at least no restrictions on it. They went with the current vice president, John Breckinridge of Kentucky. Then there was a fourth candidate in the race, John Bell from Tennessee. The Constitution Union Party was also now in the mix. Their main position on slavery was status quo, strong support for the Union. So you've got Bell, you've got Breckinridge, you've got uh, uh, Douglas, and you've got Abraham Lincoln all vying for the presidency. 
As far as the campaign was concerned, no campaigning from Abraham Lincoln. In fact, he was basically silent. No comments on any issues of policy throughout the entire campaign. He was at home, nice home in Springfield, with Mary and the kids. He basically said, refer to my old speeches. I stand by those. I stand by the Republican platform. Lincoln had a lot of visitors coming to Springfield. And he certainly engaged with them, but it was mostly small talk, his humorous anecdotes. But even some of his close friends, as we talked about before, saw below the surface that sort of true inner self of Abraham Lincoln would come through as well. Dr. Newton Bateman is a man who knew Lincoln, known Lincoln for about 20 years, and had spent a lot of time with him in the last couple of years. And during this period of the campaign, Bateman said he was the saddest man I ever knew. The saddest man I ever knew. That is one of the common refrains coming from the people who knew Abraham Lincoln the best. Well, the governor of Illinois offered Lincoln a spot in his office in the, in the Illinois State House there in Springfield to do some correspondence and spend some time. So Lincoln took him up on that opportunity. But again, no public statements on any issues of policy. He had other people from the Republican Party to do that for him, including his former competitors like William Seward and also Salmon Chase. They were out there campaigning while he was staying at home in Springfield. Lincoln did hire one person to his campaign staff. He's a 28-year-old by the name of John Nicolay. He was his one-man campaign staff for the entire thing and would eventually go with him to the White House. There was only one change for Lincoln during this period. He started to grow a beard for the first time. And it wasn't his idea. It was a suggestion from an 11-year-old girl from Westfield, New York, by the name of Grace Bedell. She wrote to Lincoln and said, You would look a great deal better, for your face is so thin. All the ladies like whiskers, and they would tease their husbands to vote for you, and then you would be president. Well, Lincoln said, okay, and he started growing a beard for the first time. The Democrats, the Southern Democrats in particular, were very clear about this election. If you vote for a Republican, you vote for Lincoln, that could mean national fracture. Disunion was very much on the ballot box in terms of the votes that were going to be held on November 6th of 1860. And a whole bunch of people showed up. Over 81% of the eligible voters cast a ballot in this, more than any other election to date in American history. And of that popular vote, Lincoln got less than 40%, the smallest amount of any winner. Part of that is because he didn't get a single vote a popular vote in any of 10 southern states because it wasn't even on the ballot in those states. But Lincoln easily won in the Electoral College, got about 60% of the vote in the Electoral College, far more than a majority of what he needed. Breckenridge was second. Stephen Douglas, he actually finished last in the Electoral College. He was second in the popular vote, but he was last in terms of the Electoral College. So Abraham Lincoln is now the president-elect of the United States, launching the most perilous period in American history. And that is Abraham Lincoln and the most important election from the life of Abraham Lincoln. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.